Friends and colleagues, welcome to Singapore Perspectives 2015. This year's gathering takes place on the 50th anniversary of Singapore's founding as a sovereign, independent state. The theme of the conference is choices. What might have been and what might have been, what has been, and what that tells us of what might be, of what could be. What parts did we take over the past 50 years and what parts we didn't and what that tells us of the parts that we might take over the next 50 years. This is a conference at once about our past as well as about our future. We look back so as to look forward. The conceptualization of this year's Singapore Perspectives was not done by me or my senior colleagues at IPS. It was the work of our junior colleagues, our interns and research assistants, among them Minwei, Zheyang, Ekiet and Hamsia. I want to thank all of them, as well as Sufen and IPS research fellow Dr. Carol Soon, who mothered them all and kept everyone else more or less in line. Next, I thank our sponsors, GIC and Keppel, Tamasek and NTUC Enterprise, and all the others we have listed on the backdrop behind me. Singapore Perspectives has become something of a signpost in the national annual calendar. Invariably held in January, the conference has come to signify like the Roman god of beginnings and endings, Janus, after which January is named, a pause in the calendar, a moment to look back as we look forward. We couldn't have made Singapore Perspectives such a hinge without the support of our sponsors, almost all of whom have been with us for many years through good times as well as bad. On behalf of our special advisor, Professor Tommy Koh, and everyone else at IPS, my heartfelt thanks to all of them for their unstinting generosity. And finally, the speakers at this conference, my old friend, Bilahari Kausikan and Evelyn Goh, Tan Kong Yam and Linda Lim, and the two distinguished chairs of the panels, Professor Tan Ta Yong and Lee Suan. The debaters we have lined up, Kisho Mahobani, and Tong Yi, Eugene Tan, and Vikram Khanna, and their chair, Deborah Soon. The young team from the School of Interactive and Digital Media at Nanyang Polytechnic, who produced the little documentaries you will see in a little while. Yan Ling, Casey, Vanessa, Jack, and Chen Xian. Deputy Prime Minister, Teo Chi Hien, and Minister for Social and Family Development, Chan Chun Singh, who will be with us this afternoon. And lastly, Irene Lim, Kiaming, and all the rest of the IPS admin team who have been toiling away for months organizing these events. To all of them, a big thank you. And of course, you, the audience, turning up at 8.30 a.m. on a Monday morning, taking time off from your work to attend a conference potentously titled Choices, well, I'm grateful. There are many in the audience who come every year. I'm happy to greet them all as familiar friends. Some are new, including Attorney General V.K. Raja. It is gratifying we have an audience of almost 1,000 from many walks in life, the public sector, NGOs, schools, universities, polytechnics, and ITEs, civil society, and the corporate world. I hope this conference meets your expectations. Fifty years ago today, our future was uncertain. We didn't know it then, but on February 26, 1965, the Singapore Cabinet debated a paper that Mr. Lee Kuan Yew had written on possible constitutional rearrangements in Malaysia. 1964 had been tense. The People's Action Party had contested the Malaysian general election in April 1964, but won only one seat among the nine it contested in peninsular Malaysia. In July 1964, and again in September, 
Singapore exploded in racial riots, killing a total of 36 people and injuring 560. Singapore and Kuala Lumpur clashed repeatedly in the federal parliament, in the media, and on the ground. Singapore saw no economic advantage in merger, the reason why we had joined Malaysia in the first place, believing a small island could not survive without a hinterland. For example, the Economic Development Board had to seek permission from Kuala Lumpur to award pioneer certificates to prospective investors here, entitling them to tax-free status for five to ten years. In the two years we were in Malaysia, only two out of 69 such applications were approved, and one came with so many restrictions, it amounted to a rejection. Dr. Goh Keng Sui recounts in his oral history a conversation he had with a World Bank expert who was advising Kuala Lumpur and Singapore on the common market. Suppose the Malaysian finance minister Tan Siu Sin does not play the game and the common market does not get off the ground. What happens? Dr. Goh recalls asking the World Bank expert. The expert answered presciently thus, in that event, Mr. Minister, it's not the common market which should be in danger. The whole concept of Malaysia would be in danger. By December 1964, the Malaysian Prime Minister Tunku Abdul Rahman was already sounding a warning. If the politicians of various colors and tinges and flashes in Singapore disagree with me, the only solution is break away he said in a speech to the Medical College in Singapore. Ten days later, on December 19th, he spelled out to Mr. Lee privately what he meant by a breakaway. Singapore was to be in partnership, independent, but part of the peninsula. In other words, a confederation, not a fed, not, in other words, a confederation not a federation. The Singapore government was to have all the powers it had in the years of self-government between 1959 and 1963, prior to joining Malaysia. Kuala Lumpur would be in charge of only defense and external relations, as the British had been, in an, and, and both governments would share responsibility for security in an internal security council. Singapore citizens would not participate in Malaysian politics and Malaysian citizens would withdraw from political activity on the island. This was the substance of the paper Mr. Lee presented to his cabinet on January 26, 50 years ago today. Mr. S. Rajaratnams and Dr. To Chin Chai vehemently opposed the proposals but the majority of the cabinet supported the idea, according to Mr. Lee. They saw disengagement as a way to avoid bloodshed. But the proposal floundered for a number of reasons. One, it soon became apparent that the Tunku wanted Singapore out of the Malaysian parliament altogether. But he wanted Singapore to contribute to the cause of Malaysian defense with a portion of Singapore's tax revenue going to Kuala Lumpur. There could be no taxation without representation, Mr. Lee told the Tunku. We cannot become a colony in Malaysia. Two, Kuala Lumpur wanted Singapore out of Malaysian politics, but he wasn't prepared for the quid pro quo, Malaysia out of Singapore politics. Their fundamental precondition, Mr. Lee was to write in his memoirs decades later, was that not only in Malaysia, but even in Singapore itself, the PAP would stay out of the Malay world and leave it entirely to UMNO to deal with the Malays, even in Singapore. And finally, the British got wind of the talks and scuttled everything. They were defending Malaysia against Indonesia's confrontation and they weren't prepared to see their rear disintegrate 
uh, while they defended the frontier. Instead of a looser confederation, what they wanted was a national government with PAP ministers in the federal cabinet. What would have happened if the British had not scuttled the confederation idea? There was a reasonable chance that the two parties, Singapore and KL, might have come to an agreement. We cannot say with certainty 50 years later, but it is probably fortunate that the confederation idea collapsed. It would have given us one country, two systems, decades before Teng Xiaoping proposed it for Hong Kong. Only in this case, it would have been an arrangement between two peoples who had perhaps less in common than Hong Kongers have with PRC Chinese today, despite which, see what difficulty the special administrative region has had. In retrospect, it may seem obvious that with the Confederation idea having collapsed by February 1965, separation six months later was inevitable. But there was nothing inevitable about any of it. As uncomfortable as the Malaysian leaders were with separation, there was always at the back of their minds a fear that Singapore out of Malaysia was a worse possibility than a Singapore in Malaysia. Indeed, a few years after separation, both the Tunku and Tun Razak were to express regret for having let Singapore go. And as glad as the entire Singaporean leadership, indeed almost all Singaporeans, were to become that Singapore had extricated itself from Malaysia, that wasn't the consensus view, even within the PAP at that time. Singapore shall forever be a sovereign, democratic and independent nation, the proclamation read on August 9th, 1965. On August 8th, there were many among the ten who signed the separation agreement who doubted if Singapore should ever be an independent nation, let alone be independent forever. The desire for independence came the day after, on August 10th. There were at least three views within the Singapore leadership then. One, a group that felt that since the common market wasn't in the offing, merger was literally useless. Trying to make a political success of an arrangement that lacked an economic rationale was pointless. Dr. Go Keng Sui seems to have been the first Singaporean leader who arrived at this conclusion. He was instrumental in effecting the extrication of the albatross around our necks that Malaysia had become. Others who held this view included Mr. E. W. Barker, who was to draft the separation agreement, and Mr. Lim Kim Sun. Two, a more pronounced political group that believed with every fiber of their being that Singapore was an inextricable part of Malaysia. And they owed it to the millions they had mobilized in both East and West Malaysia to fight on, fight on, unbowed and dauntless for a Malaysian Malaysia. Dr. Tho and Mr. Rajaratnam in particular held this view, as did Mr. Ong Pang Boon. They signed the separation agreement with a heavy heart, impelled more by loyalty to the movement and Mr. Lee than conviction that separation was the right cause. It is next to impossible for almost all of us here to understand the depth of these sentiments. History with its flickering lamb stumbles along the trail of the past, trying to reconstruct its scenes, to revive its echoes, and kindle with pale gleams the passion of former days, Churchill once wrote. Let me speak personally for a moment to try to revive some of these echoes. My father, Devon Nair, was the only PAP candidate to have won a seat in the 1964 Malaysian general election. Therefore, when separation came, he was the only Singaporean leader with a seat in the Malaysian parliament by virtue of representing a constituency in the peninsula, not Singapore. Dr. Goh had arranged with Tun Razak that no PAP MP would be present in the Malaysian parliament when it voted on the separation bill. 
But Mr. Devon Nye, however, attended and declared that Malaysia might have separated from Singapore, but it had not separated from him. In a speech interrupted many times by the government benches, he spoke of a wrench in the heart and announced he would remain in Malaysia and continue fighting for a Malaysian Malaysia. Thus, the PAP in Malaysia became the Democratic Action Party, or DAP, now the largest opposition party in Malaysia. Contrary to rumors then and now, this decision was made, this decision to remain behind in Malaysia was his and not that of the Singapore leadership. It took another two and a half years for Mr. Lee to persuade him to return to Singapore. Mr. Devon Nair announced in May 1968 that he was resigning as DAP Secretary General and would not recontest his seat in the Malaysian Parliament in the next GE. He returned to Singapore and NTUC in 1969. He was the last among Singapore's leadership of that time to accept that separation was irreversible. He was 45 when he finally received his IC. He had believed till then that he was a Malayan. So had all the founding fathers of Singapore, including Mr. Lee. He had said on August 9, 1965, that he had fought for merger all his adult life and that he would always look back on that day as a moment of anguish. After the idea of a looser confederation had floundered in February 1965, Mr. Lee had adopted a strategy fraught with enormous risk to himself and his colleagues, including the possibility that he could, he might have been bumped off, as then Prime Minister, British Prime Minister Harold Wilson recognized. He decided to raise the stakes considerably. Either the Malaysian leadership settled on our terms a non-communal, multiracial, and multi-religious polity, or they had to let us hive off, to use a phrase of the Tunkus. So Mr. Lee backed the Malaysian Solidarity Convention that Dr. To and Mr. Rajaratnam had formed, linked up all the non-communal parties, political parties in Malaysia, and didn't let up on the campaign for a Malaysian Malaysia. If anyone tried to start another riot in Singapore, they would have to account for the possibility of riots spreading to all the urban centers in the peninsula. In the meantime, Dr. Goh, who had begun talks with Tun Razak on July 13 or thereabouts, told the Tunku's key lieutenants they should settle fast before Mr. Lee became irretrievably committed to the Malaysian Solidarity Convention and won more support for the PAP, both at home and abroad in the Commonwealth. The Tunku himself had by then concluded that he wanted Singapore out of Malaysia and had asked Tun Razak to pursue all options, including outright separation with Dr. Goh. Dr. Goh, committed as he was by then to independence, took the bull by the horns, got a letter of authorization from Mr. Lee to pursue all options with the Malaysian leadership, ignored the idea of a looser confederation, plumped straight for separation, suggested all the necessary constitutional instruments be put through the Malaysian parliament on August 9th, and insisted on absolute secrecy, especially from the British. Within little more than four weeks, a constitutional coup or negotiated separation, as the draftsman of our independence, Mr. Barker, put it in his oral history, was encompassed. I have said elsewhere that these months, from January to August 1965, was the founding generation's finest hour. And I'm not referring here only to the leaders of that time, but also to the electorate that coalesced around them. For if Singaporeans had allowed themselves to be cowed, we might still have been offered one country, two system, as late as August 1965. Fortunately, our forefathers were a pride of lions led by lions. Why do I recall this history? 
to remind ourselves there was nothing inevitable about our founding. What might have been and what has been point to one end, which is always present, the poet T.S. Eliot wrote. A people who forget their history will perish. I fear we might well become such a people. Raised in clover and accustomed to success, our elite especially have come to regard themselves as self-created, self-sustaining, self-perpetuating entities. What is, is they have no antecedents, history is bunk. So they come to believe, for instance, that we were never vulnerable, that vulnerabilities are myths, lies. Only a people who forget their history can delude themselves so. What might have been and what has been point to one end which is always present. Consider this, we came close to getting one country, two systems before we stumbled on separation. All our founding leaders initially believe Singapore couldn't survive without a hinterland. They only abandoned the idea when it became obvious a common market when Malaysia wasn't on the cards. Even then, it hadn't occurred to them the world could be our hinterland. Or if it had occurred to some of them, they didn't as yet know how to give effect to that vision. The notion of a global city was some years away, globalization decades. That we could be a hub in a variety of fields, that MNCs could be our ticket, that we could be the center of this, that, or the other, none was obvious. What might have been and what has been point to one end which is always present. What might be that one end which is always present? It means the parts not taken as well as the parts taken remain always possibilities now. It means the risks avoided, the successes attained, the dangers circumvented, the achievements chanced upon, all are never wholly voided or erased. It means our history, for 50 years now, a triumphant arc that bent always towards sunlit uplands and fresh pastures, our history can still turn tragic. What might have been and what has been point to one end which is always present. The one constant in our history has been our audacity. Pray they may always remain so. Thank you very much.